Good evening. Welcome to the Dryden Theater at the George Eastman Museum. My name is Gordon Nelson, and I'm the Assistant Curator of Digital Collections in the Moving Image Department. And it is uh, my honor to introduce our guest tonight, who is Virginia L. Montgomery, or VLM. Um, this, this is, we're going to experience an artist's talk, and, um, and it's going to last for, for a little while, and then there will be time for Q&A afterwards. So please, if you have any questions, we'll, we'll be able to answer those. Um, Virginia has traveled all the way from Austin, Texas, to be with us tonight. So it's, it's really a great honor to have us here with us, and, uh, and so we can learn more about, about how Virginia works. Um, to say a little more, Virginia is, uh, her, her bio describes her as a multimedia artist who works with video performance, sound design, and sculpture mediums. And so, so there's this whole world of Virginia's work that, um, that I haven't seen in person because I, I, I work in moving image and my entry point was through um, her, her um, video work. And um, I discovered Virginia's work in a, in a sort of, uh, well, I, I don't know if it's an unusual way, but something um, that was an outcome, I, I suppose, of the pandemic. Um, film festivals, more and more during the pandemic, were forced to uh, offer their um, screenings online. And um, that's, a, that's something I think most film festivals don't love doing that because it's, you know, it's nice to have that audience and be in person. But um, the advantage is, well, sometimes it reaches a broader audience and a further audience. And so I, I was um, perusing online uh, the Video Art and Experimental Film Festival, a New York City-based festival uh, in the 2021 edition. And uh, this is where I saw a, a little film, uh, video short, I should say, uh, entitled Butterfly Birthbed, which is a 2020 production. Um, I found this video remarkable. I was stunned. Um, loosely, the film could be described about being about the lives of butterflies, but um, I saw a few things in the video that um, I love to see. And one, the first thing that, that uh, just really grabbed me was the incredible, incredible amount of craft involved, the technique involved in um, bringing us into this tiny world. Um, it looked like a, a really high quality um, nature documentary, but of course, um, Virginia's work goes beyond that. Um, and it, it's not just a pure uh, study of nature, but it, it reaches into these other aspects of adding surrealism and uh, mystical elements to, the, to the, this tiny micro world. And then the other thing that, uh, that I love to see is, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of insect films, uh, among, among many other types of films, but I do, I do love a good documentary about insects or, or, or movies about, about insects. Uh, and Virginia's work really made the insects into not just the stars of the, the movie, but they felt like collaborators to me. And so the, the, the insects were really elevated in terms of their, uh, their, their place in, in the cosmos and in life. And uh, I think those, those, are, those are really beautiful aspects. And it's, it's not a very deep uh, reading, I think, of Virginia's work, but, but that's, that's one of the reasons why we have Virginia here tonight, because <laughs> she'll give us a lot more insight, I think. But, um, but I came away feeling like there was so much beauty uh, to behold in the work and, and so much care and sensitivity. And um, I, I felt uh, I was over the moon when Virginia accepted uh, my invitation to, to show her work here. So I ho hope you've had a chance to see Virginia's work. It is uh, located in um, the Wolk Concourse, the video gallery, which is very close to our entrance way. And um, there's, a, there's a, a program playing, um, which is a, a very nice selection of her video work. But tonight, uh, when, we, when we hear from Virginia, 
um, we're going to learn um, about the, 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 her practice, her entire practice, not just video, but r remember, Virginia is, is, a, is an artist of many more um, facets than, than pure video. So um, let's go on a journey of discovery with Virginia. Please let me welcome Virginia, Virginia L. Montgomery. Thank you so much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I am from Austin, Texas, and it is a joy to be in this beautiful spring environment. Where I'm coming from, it's almost summer, so being here and seeing all the magnolia trees outside and the tulips, as a nature person, it's, it's heavenly. But uh, today I'm gonna walk you through kind of a high level representation of my art practice. I'm going to throw a lot of information at you. So thank you for coming on this journey and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. So anything's up, anything's up. So um, as an artist, I'm frequently described as someone who thinks in symbols and throughout this art talk, really key into imagery of circles, holes, spheres, because that's going to be a really nice guiding framework through these various projects that I do. I'm someone who was born and raised in Houston. I got my BFA at the University of Texas at Austin. I did my MFA at Yale University in the sculpture department, which there is their intermediate department where one also can do experimental film and sound design. Um, my Research space does span a couple of areas. I love pulling insight from philosophy, specifically contemporary metaphysical philosophy. Um, and also biology is a huge influence of mine. And I like to think that where these spaces overlap is the art zone. And my own practice, as mentioned, spans video art, sound design, sculpture installation, science, entomology, moths and butterflies. I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, unusual studio practice of actually raising the moths and butterflies that I collaborate with. And then at the very end of this talk, I'm going to just dip into a little bit about my day job, because as an artist, I always like to talk about the full spectrum of activity that I'm up to. And so that will be dipping into the space of communication, specifically graphic facilitation. And I'll describe what that is at the end. So circles, they will be coming up. I also really think that they're a beautiful mechanism for connecting ideas. And I really do think that symbols are this kind of magical, divine object that helps us peer into portals and in different realms. This is a very short kind of 30 second clip I'm going to show from an art residency that I recently did in a small town called Corsicana, Texas, where I raised some moths and butterflies in a former secret society lodge. And so this little snippet is just going to kind of show what my setup looks like in a studio environment. Hi, my name is VLM, Virginia L. Montgomery. I'm a multimedia artist, and I'm from Austin, Texas. Here at Corsicana, I have been working on an ambitious project where I have been hatching live luna moths from cocoons and then creating a small, delicate obstacle course I wanted to find a way of making a collaborative soundscape with a non-human protagonist. It is a symbolic film about the omnipresence of the circle as a form that is consistent across species. And um, it's also a film about destruction and hope. So that's me um, in a studio environment. Uh, and the work that I made when I was there was the film Bella Luna that's currently on display across the way at the gallery. And it's this surreal three minute video that features this macro 
choreographic encounter with me in a Luna Moth, so I highly recommend checking it out. This is um, otherwise what it looks like when I'm in the studio. It's a lot of me behind the camera. I do like to use just a Sony, you know, a7 IV camera. I'm a big fan of kind of the run and gun modality of shooting, especially when you're working with things like moths and butterflies that are very erratic and unpredictable. So I have to be very improvisational in the studio when I'm working with them. When I'm raising um, moths and butterflies, I have setups like this. So this is actually an entomology grade um, mesh flight cage. And the moths that I work with that I show in my films have always just hatched within the first 48 hours. And that's partly because the first 48 hours that they come out of their cocoons, they're very quiet and placid. And then after those 48 hours, when their wings have fully dried, they are just on a mission to get out there in the world and fly and find mates and lay eggs. And so at that point, I end up releasing them outside. So um, one of the things that I love about combining you know, my interest in being a citizen scientist and an experimental artist is I like to think, well, you know, if if one criticizes the practice of experimental art, at least I can say I have now released dozens and dozens of moths and butterflies into the environment. And um, these collaborations with butterflies and luna moths um, that I've been working on is something that I've been doing the last few years, but uh, it's directly related to my passion for ecofeminist theory. In particular, there's one theorist I love, which is Donna Haraway. She's an incredible incredible mind, someone that spans anthropology, feminism, philosophy, and uh, a lot of her work that she's been coming up with the last few years really puts contemporary kind of post-wave, uh, post-fourth wave feminism within a space of panpsychic metaphysics, which positions the idea that if we really want to completely neutralize um, ideas of oppression, we need to find a way of recognizing the sentience of other, other things around us. And by things, I mean not necessarily um, animals or plants, but extending consciousness all the way down to rocks or bodies of water. And I do have a little blurb there at the bottom about this beautiful parliamentary decision in 2017 that granted a river the same legal rights as a human, and that was done so in order to help aid the conservation of the river. I like to put that there because even if you do think that you know panpsychic metaphysical ecofeminism is a bit woo-woo, it can have a productive political uh, affect. So, so this this research is very important to me. Another point of inspiration is this wonderful film, Meshes in the Afternoon, which I heard recently screened here. Did anyone see that when that was playing here? Thank you, Gordon, yeah. But um, yeah, so Mai's work is work that really stuck out to me when I was a young artist, in part because the imagery does pull so much from that subconscious space of the dream world where you see a lot of symbols kind of flashing very quickly and they start to pull together these ideas that hint at what is it like to have a kind of a other experience that really calls into play this idea of like, what does it mean to have a body? And what does it mean to be experiencing um, reality through these little, these little sensorial moments? And that is something that just was such a revelation to me because I'm an individual who's neurodivergent. I have very, very strong hearing motion synesthesia. And so synesthesia is that condition where for me, whenever I see movement, my mind automatically ascribes a sound to it. And so at all times, I'm always kind of hearing a soundtrack. <laughs> I've learned to quiet it, but it's always there. And so when I encountered experimental film, I was like, oh my gosh, this is how my brain operates. And I'm always hearing a soundtrack. And so my entry point into experimental film and sound design was really kind of out of a desire of just being able to replicate the interior world that I naturally experienced, but then also finding a way of relating that to issues in the external world, which in my case, it would be, you know, ecofeminism and, uh, you know, wanting to just reveal these like little mystical secrets about nature. But um, Meshes in the Afternoon, I'm just going to play a 20 second clip because I adore this film. Also, I love these close ups of eyeballs and 
but the uh, but the dream space really really inspired me. Jumping ahead, uh, this is a recent work that I did just last year. I had this big solo show in Austin at this wonderful gallery institution called Women in Their Work, which is the second oldest feminist institution in the United States, which I think is brilliant. They were actually the recipient of the first NEA grant in the entire state of Texas. So I was honored when I was able to present this large exhibition there called I Moon Cocoon, and it was an exhibition that was a very surreal unpacking of this performance that I did at NASA Space Center Houston, where um, I took secretly into Space Center Houston a small collection of live Luna moths. And then um, my mother secretly filmed me one at a time introducing these live Luna moth cocoons to the Moon Rocks and the Moon Rock collection. And the reason this action was important to me is in thinking about kind of metaphysical issues of proximity, I thought it was so uncanny that a small creature like a Luna moth, which is named after the moon, and like all moths is mesmerized with the moon, is something that for millions of years has never actually been able to get close to the thing that it loves. And so I thought, okay, well, what if I use art and performance as a mechanism of bridging that gap by introducing these live Luna moths to the moon rocks so they have that proximity relationship? And then afterwards, I'll take those live Luna moths and I will hatch them and just see what happens. And so this body of artwork uh, unpacks that from a metaphysical perspective. This installation was a large multi-channel installation with these large sculptural objects, including a multi-tier pile of blue memory foam with a large 100-pound carved marble stone in the middle. I also do some stone carving. I was trying to make it a large moth egg that was then seated on this memory foam, again, to invoke a dream space I also love the fact that doing research that I discovered that it was actually NASA that invented memory foam. So again, just trying to find these different relationships between science and mysticism and luna moths and the dream world and surrealism. And then the other component within the space was the bed. So this is the same bed that appears in my film, Butterfly Birthbed. And um, as some of you that are based in New York may notice that this is actually a shaker bed. I have been deeply inspired by the shakers for quite a while in part because they are a mystical spiritual community that um, has always been opposed to prejudice and I found that so inspiring. And I also just loved the architecture of the bed. So I think a lot about bed space as being a mechanism to facilitate dreams and dream space and bed space and so Within this environment of me going to sleep at night and dreaming, I was thinking, oh, well, maybe the Luna moths also want to have a place to dream. So if you see in the far left-hand corner, that's an image of a moth scale uh, shaker bed that I constructed. And uh, the film that goes with this piece, the new film is called um, Moon Moth Bed, and it documents this Luna moth that hatches from my hand goes through a small uh, obstacle course of bells and sticks, and then finds her way to this bed, which has a small 3D printed model of the moon, um, which you can download from NASA's website, actually, and 3D print it. And then the moth kind of unfurls her wings. And then also in the far corner, there's a projection of my eye looking through a hole, and the eye kind of follows you and blinks at you as you move through the space. Uh, this is a close-up of the stone that I carved, egg stone. Um, and so when you were in this gallery environment, you would be invited to kind of sit down on the big pad of memory foam and then lean in and touch the stone. 
And so you would again have that kind of wonderful synesthesia moment of being able to hear the soundscape and watch the visuals and then also touch the smoothness and the coolness of the polished stone and then also feel the weirdness of sinking into all that memory foam and your body's trying to find its own weight. And so that kind of multi-layering of senses is something that I just love to work with in the studio. Here's another vantage point of this stone and foam sculpture. I've carved about four of these big stones now. Um, stone carving is a real labor of love, but it really helps me have this deep appreciation for time, because as a film editor, I think so much about how video art and experimental film is basically like little pieces of time, and you're working with time to kind of make this constructed entity, which is the film. But however, when you stone carve, if you think about a rock being a big piece of time, you're actually like chipping away at it to make a different type of time entity. So what I like about filmmaking is that it's like an additive process. What I like about stone carving, it's a subtractive process. So I think about them both as being labors of time, but very different. So this is Moon Moth Bed. I'm just gonna show you like the first 30 seconds of it or so. I also am happy to share it with anyone in full if you wanna see it. But here it is. So this is the Luna Moth that I took to NASA and showed to the Moon Rocks. sounds that nature puts together and then a lot of those little bells in the background are also field recordings taken from the moths as they're crawling around the bells and the sticks and uh, all of this is live action so even though it might look unreal I, I promise it's all lens based it's made with a real camera and real stuff but what you are seeing throughout the film is this interesting technique that I invented. And I'm just gonna pause this for a second and scrub through it, where um, in my films, I really do like to investigate this metaphysical inquiry of like, what is reality? And something that I always love about film is that um, everything kind of feels unreal after a while. It's kind of hard to tell like, well, what is real, what is not? And so for me, I, I'm really interested in kind of calling into uh, acknowledgement the fact that, you know, the digital space is both a physical space and a non-physical space. And so I really want to investigate that by actually like penetrating that fourth wall in the filmic space. And so I do that by taking a screen capture from the video feed that I'm working on, I then take that image, I print it out on foam core board, I then take a drill, I drill into that image, but then I'm recording that exact moment and then putting it back in the timeline. So that's why when you're watching it, you're suddenly like, well, what's going on? It's not, it's not any type of CGI, it's just practical effects, but it does create this really fascinating kind of optical moment. We are like, oh my gosh, so I, I love, love, love bringing this kind of recurring circular motif throughout all of my various video practices. And um, to pause this at the end, usually the film um, tends to build in momentum. So things start out very kind of soft and peaceful. This is you know, the moth unfurling her wings once she actually reaches the side of the moon on the bed. And then towards the end, things really start to kind of break down into abstraction. 
at the moment where my hand enters into the filmic space. And it's like once the human makes contact with the dream world, then that unleashes kind of the fury of the bell. And that's when that drill comes through and really starts to disrupt everything. So um, there's a lot of play and whimsy throughout my video practice. Uh, as you can see, this is an image of the moon that's been drilled into. And so there are these moments in the films that are just filled with these symbolic representations of destruction. But I also want there to be moments of healing and hope that appear in the video. And so within my own kind of linguistic uh, material index, I really like to introduce honey. So you will see a lot of honey coming through. And again, it's a beautiful substance that cross-culturally has been used as a way of symbolizing transformation or healing. I always like to think about that fact that the ancient Egyptians embalmed the bodies of the pharaohs and honey. But um, this is just a nice honey drip that I'll play. So this is my, oh, sorry. That's my eye. So I am a, um, I am a true one woman army. I perform in my own work. I shoot my own work. I edit my own work. I do my own sound design. And so, yeah, everything you'll see in this is a, um, re relates to my physicality in some way. But uh, an eye's gonna look through the hole. And then what you're seeing right there is honey that is sliding down a TV screen with that foam core board in front of it. But these jump cuts are so tight. And then this is the, uh, yeah, the honey again coming down that TV screen. So you can see moments where the kind of the um, light is giving that kind of interesting rainbow effect. If you've ever wondered what honey on a TV screen looks like, this is what it looks like. <laughs> but these moments of material experimentation just bring me so much joy. And for me, that's just one of the most exciting things about getting inside the studio and just trying to think about what different material relationships can I explore with materials, but also trying to do it in a way that is uh, uh, still feels very kind of gentle and feminine and not too, uh, too aggressive. As much as I have these disruptive moments with the drill, I'm, I'm truthfully trying to make work that is more about philosophy than just shock value. So um, these are some, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> well, you know, I guess to speak to that philosophically, we're living in a pretty horrible, violent era, and I take a lot of care about what type of imagery I'm putting out into the world. And so if anything, I just would rather cultivate a passion for, you know, the delicacy of nature, or looking at details, or I would hope people would also be just as enchanted by circles and their presence across scale from you know macro to micro. But uh, to me, that's much more uh, important than, than trying to like re-traumatize, because I'm really, really not trying to contribute to a space of trauma right now. There's enough of that going on. Um, yeah, so these are some more images of the install. Um, this is a screenshot from the film O Luna that's currently on display. So this was from a few years ago. At this is just going to be a short 30 second clip of this work. It similarly has Luna moths. This is a close up of a Luna moth egg. Um, they are teeny tiny, about the size of a pinhead when they first are laid. And then that, you know, later uh, the caterpillar emerges as a you know, good six inch moth. So it's amazing the scale that that goes through. But anyway, this is a Luna within about 30 seconds. Yeah, so those are some of the newly emerged teeny, teeny little caterpillars. They are so tiny. Okay, so that's the loop. That's just the first eight seconds of the film, and you can watch the full film across, across the museum space. Another sequence of a newly emerged Luna moth with teeny, tiny little wings climbing up bells. This is how I get my wonderful bell soundscapes. 
Um, this process of the wings unfurling in real time takes about 45 minutes, so there's this time lapse to speed up that process for you all. And uh, this was Oluna showing um, at the Contemporary Austin a few years ago. That's where the piece was commissioned. Um, here's a, an image of what it looks like if you would like to sit on the memory foam and watch the film at the same time. And um, something about this piece that I was really interested in exploring was this relationship between subject and object. So as a filmmaker, I think a lot about how I am behind a camera on a tripod spending hours staring at my lovely Luna Moth collaborators. And then again, thinking about how I can provide the Luna Moth with more agency and have this be more of kind of an equal relationship. I was like, oh, well, maybe I should sculpt a small moth scale camera for the Luna Moth so she can look back at me and we can have the same type of dynamic in the studio. And so that's what you're seeing here. It's, it's a miniature moth scale DSLR camera. <laughs> and again, this is all real. This is not Photoshop. You know, this is really the size at which this happened. You know, that is, that is my own finger. You know, I have the same manicure now as then. And uh, there's this tiny tripod, which, you know, I intentionally made out of a safety pin and wanted it to look kind of imperfect so you knew that it was a handmade object. And uh, this, this moment appears within that film, O Luna. And uh, if I scrub back to the full video, oh, sorry guys. Okay. There's a moment towards the end of the video where you can kind of see this small macro set environment that I've built. So this is, um, me as always kind of playing the role of the somewhat curious disembodied human collaborator coming on screen and I'm introducing this small camera to my Luna Moth friend. And uh, I really like how disengaged <laughs> the moth is. Um, this shot was very, very significant for me to capture because incentivizing a Luna Moth to do anything on camera is near impossible. They, uh, unlike butterflies, do not have working mouth parts. You can't bribe them with sugar water. A lot of people don't know this, but Luna Moths actually are, are born without mouths or digestive tracts or any of that stuff. They emerge from their cocoon purely just to mate and lay eggs, and that's it. That's why they only live about a week if you think about it this way, they emerge from the cocoon with only about one tank of gas. And once that tank is up, they're done. So um, when I work with these Luna moths, like every second that I'm with them is so special because they don't live that long. And again, as an artist who thinks a lot about how special time is, I, I really feel honored when I'm able to share these little moments with them, especially a moment like this where, you know, this Luna Moth, she probably just emerged about an hour or so ago, which is why, again, she's so placid, because she's just waiting for her wings to dry. And so I get to have these little engagements with the Luna Moths. Oh yeah, so this is another drill moment where uh, I really liked this idea of the drill kind of becoming the lens, and then the drill goes through all the different circle shapes. That's a macro image of an eye spot on a Luna Mop wing. And uh, that's a cocoon. So that's the you know drill coming through the mouth of the cocoon after the Luna Mop exited. And uh, yeah, so it's all these different meditations on kind of the omnipresence of the circle through this different filmic process. Yeah, so that's the very end of o Luna. You can see the other three minutes in between across the way. And uh, yeah, so here are some images, some photos that I made from that collaboration I was just showing. So this is the moth with the miniature camera. I love this image because it was her showing her full wings. And so these beautiful round eye spots are just so spectacular to me. And from doing a lot of research into Luna moths, Something that I thought was so incredible is that there are fossil records of insects 
with uh, eye spots on their wings that go back to 150 million years ago. Whereas the last age of the dinosaurs was the Cretaceous era, which was about 65 million years ago. So this, as a visual communications mechanism, has been around for 150 million years, which just blows my mind. So I really do think that there's something special about the circle being kind of a subconscious linguistic signaling device to denote, you know, obviously an eye spot, but beyond that to denote like the presence of a creature being like, hey, I'm here. And the fact that this evolved even before us as mammals was on the planet, but still exists as a communication mechanism just blows my mind, blows my mind. So these are some other images. I love this one. It's like the camera's kind of looking at you. The moth is photographing you. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to check the time really quick. OK. Yeah, so this is in the studio, Circles and Spheres. Um, this was a project that I did a few years ago called Honeymoon. And it was a commission by the Times Square Art Alliance in New York City, which is this wonderful organization that shows a unique piece of video art every night at midnight all across these different jumbotrons in New York Times. And my proposition when I was asked to make a proposal was to do this film called Honeymoon, which is deeply literal. And it is just this coy image of my hand holding that same 3D printed model of the moon that you saw in the bed earlier in that other film. And my other hand off screen is holding a big bottle of honey and squirting down honey. And so the video itself is this uh, single shot, three minute capture that just shows honey scrolling down, just dripping down the side of this moon. And what really inspired me to make this particular piece specifically for Times Square was in thinking about how Times Square is just this busy, chaotic, hyper-capitalist, just trying to sell you stuff space. I was like, well, wouldn't it be interesting if I did something that was kind of temporally the opposite? So instead of you know rapid jump cuts and something trying to sell you an idea, instead it would just be this kind of iconic, witchy image of a hand holding the moon, something that would just be kind of aggressively serene and just exist up there. And uh, so that was my desire with Honeymoon. And um, for me as an artist, when this came on the jumbotrons at midnight, getting to share that Times Square space with other tourists and see this work come up was amazing because people didn't really know it was coming up. And so suddenly tourists would just be like, what is going on? And suddenly all these different moons, you know, would be on the screens. And I also loved the night that the actual moon was in the sky, because for me that just completed the philosophic proposition of negation, where you just have all these different synthetic digital moons and then the actual moon, and then this just really beautiful kind of surreal digital material embodied relationship between the two. So this was the honeymoon project. So I I have been obsessed with the moon and moon moths for quite a while. Yeah, and so this, this full video is available on my website. Um, there's also a really nice, I'm gonna scrub through it really quick because I love this second flow of honey that comes down. Oh, there it is. It's just like so satisfying to watch it move. Yeah, yeah, so um, this video is, uh, it's on my website if you happen to have friends in Sacramento, California, actually at the Kings baseball stadium, they're playing this video in between uh, uh, digital advertisements, which I think is delightful. So um, I'm always excited about seeing how my videos can exist in public art contexts in different spaces. So um, I love the idea that this, this glowing image of the moon is also existing in a baseball space. <laughs> okay, so hope and healing check on the time. So the butterfly effect is what inspired the butterfly birthbed video that's on display. And that video, um, I'm just going to show some images of the initial installation that it was designed with, which was this whole installation that was about hurricanes. And for me, as I went through Hurricane Harvey, which was not fun. And uh, the butterfly birthbed video uh, is about six minutes long. You see the miniature bed in it. Thank <laughs> you. 
in addition to all this hurricane imagery. And this is the first like 10 seconds of the film. So there's the little bed, there's a uh, image from NASA of Hurricane Harvey sleeping down at the bottom. And so the metaphysical proposition for this video is, well, what if the, the butterflies emerging over the hurricane can help soothe future hurricanes so that way they will just stop coming and annihilating our coastlines? Again, this is a very magical thinking proposition. But um, in keeping with this beautiful idea of the butterfly effect, which was that lovely concept that came out of MIT in the 1970s that related to a particle, uh, particle distribution theory that the idea that a you know small butterfly flapping its wings in China would actually have an atmospheric implication that would then affect a storm system in North America. I loved the you know the romantic philosophical sentiment behind this algorithmic proposition and so I thought okay well I'm gonna use that to make an experimental art film and uh, for this one I did raise buckeye butterflies which are a wonderful North American moth uh, butterfly species, which I think you can find in this area. But um, anyway, that full video is on display across the way. I am going to stop this, and then I'm going to skip through some slides because I wanted to show you guys a little bit about my day job before we go into Q&A because this also relates to symbolism and visual communication. And this is my day job as a graphic facilitator. So I have this really unusual career that only about 40 people do. This is all new information, I'm sure, to a lot of people in the room, so don't worry. But what I am trained to do is I'm a live visual note taker. I do a lot of work for TED, like TED Talks. And what I do is I get invited to come into different spaces where people are discussing ideas or presenting ideas. And as people are sharing ideas on stage, I'm usually off to the side in front of a big whiteboard. And at the same time people are talking, I'm writing and drawing what they say. I am an extremely fast note taker. But the real training behind this skill is I have no idea what people are going to say. I can just listen think, write, and draw at the same time. And people often say, how can you do this? And usually I then tell people like, well, again, I'm, I'm, I'm neurodivergent. I'm aware that my brain kind of handles information in ways that may be atypical. And uh, you know, sometimes being a neurodivergent person means that you, know, you get overwhelmed with sensory information and things can be really frustrating. But sometimes the nice thing about being neurodivergent is that you get these kind of funny superpowers where your mind can handle information um, in really fascinating ways. And so for me, uh, as an artist, I, for the past 10 years, have been traveling around the country, going to a lot of different brainstorming meetings or TED Talks or um, like the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas where IBM might bring me in to do rapid illustrations of big data conversations. And I really enjoy this type of work because I get to learn so much about what's going on in the world, and I also get to use my love of symbols as a way of communicating information really fast. And um, I also get to travel, and that has just brought me so much appreciation for the complexity of the country. I also love the fact that I work a lot with people outside the arts, and so I love always just feeling connected. And. Uh, there are wonderful moments in my career where um, I do sometimes get to interact with celebrities, which is always really fun. And in those moments, uh, it, I'm just reminded like how, how much of an honor it is as a working artist just to be out there practicing my creative skill and also finding a way of sharing my own creative skill sets, you know, not necessarily with, you know, my beloved subculture of experimental art and experimental art enthusiasts, but also with people that are trying to communicate big ideas to make social change. So for example, this is a poster that I drew at a um, event in Austin that was a healthcare event that was all about helping 
midwives um, and nurse practitioners gain expanded rights in the state of Texas because we're having a lot of healthcare issues down in Texas about women having access to healthcare. So for me, it's just so inspiring to get to share my skills in these different ways. And um, oftentimes these big poster boards that I make, I'll stack them in these big towers so people can photograph it, share it online, share it on their phone. These are some of the graphics, what it looks like. And so, yeah, these are images that I make very rapidly within 45 minutes. These tend to be uh, 40 by 60 inches, so about my size. And, you know, this was a workshop that was about folks with HIV. And this was my, like, crowning achievement moment, is that LL Cool J was talking at an innovation conference, and I got to draw for him. So this was my celebrity moment that I thought was really cool. I oftentimes do get to meet like CEOs of tech companies, which is which is cool, but this is a lot cooler. So um, <laughs> this this is my one flexing moment. So um, I always like to end with this because it's just oh, it makes me feel so special. <laughs> but um, but yeah, that that is my kind of mixed studio practice spanning sculpture rock carving to installation with light design, with um, symbolic imagery, with butterflies and luna moths, because you know who doesn't like imagery that represents hope and transformation and metaphysics and metamorphosis. And um, yeah, final recap, uh, we have symbols, surrealism, ecofeminism, science, synesthesia, philosophical metaphysics, material experimentation, uncanny pragmatism. That's what I think I employ, collaboration and hope. And so that those are all the things that I just love to bring into the world. And uh, if you want to learn more about my art, I have a whole website full of past projects. And yeah, this is it. So thank you all for being a part of the practice. And again, I know it's a lot of different information, but um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer anything from like the technical, yeah, what's up? How do you raise the moths and the butterflies? How do I raise them? So, um, well, usually, so raising moths and butterflies is a very seasonal practice because they spend so much of the year in hibernation, in the cocoon or in the chrysalis. And while it is uh, possible to keep them active even in the winter months, because the plants that they don't eat aren't leafing out in the winter months, it is really seasonal. But to answer your question how I start, it usually starts with eggs. So if I'm not actually getting the eggs directly from a previous brood, then what I do is I reach out to someone from my citizen scientist entomology community, and I say, hey, do you have any eggs available? And then usually they take some eggs, they put them in an envelope, they FedEx them to me overnight, I receive the eggs, I then rehydrate them, I put them in that mesh cage that I showed at the very beginning. Then in a few weeks, the little caterpillars will emerge. So in the case of luna moths, they primarily eat sweet gum trees. And so then I have to go out in the environment and I have to cut fresh sweet gum leaves for them every day. And I do that for about three months. And once the caterpillars get big, then they spin their cocoons and then they sleep for a few months and then they emerge as full grown adults and um, typically pretty immediately they will seek each other out, they'll mate, they'll start laying eggs and then that starts the process again. So um, there are moments where I will hold on to the eggs from brood to brood and raise them but there are also moments where um, I know I'm going to be traveling and I really try not to you know bestow my caterpillar raising activities like upon my sister when I go out of town. So, <laughs> so in those instances, what I'll do is I'll just release the moths and butterflies to go out into the environment so they can naturally do what they do. And that is also why I only work with native North American species. So that way I'm just, you know, contributing to the ecosystem what would already be there. And, uh, but yeah, if I don't do that full egg to caterpillar to brood to brood process, then Luckily, there is a very small microculture of people that love raising moths and butterflies. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I, 
I have always loved bugs. I have always loved biology. And I'm just very happy that within the last few years that contemporary art about insects is starting to be more popular because I have had moments where curators are like, ooh, you do work about bugs. I don't know. So I'm, I've always loved insects and I'm just so happy to see that there are people that are more interested in getting up close, looking at um, these very important little participants within our ecosystem. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, oh, thank you. What a great, exciting, and fascinating discussion you've had. And you said you were going to throw a lot at us, and boy, did you ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I'm an artist with a research-based practice, which means usually I just research an idea and make artwork that relates to that. But it does mean cumulatively it's a lot of different stuff. So thank well, you for... a lot of thinking. Yeah, oh, thank you. Well, thanks for hanging tight, you know. <laughs> so um, I want to make a comment about your hands. Mm -hmm. I, I thought they were terrific. <laughs> it, it, it lended like an omnipresent uh, aspect to what the moths are doing and what your little tripod is doing. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the hand of God sneaks in <laughs> and manipulates things. And it's a whole metaphor for we could take it to a different level. This is just crazy. Um, also, I was re remarking my brain how, how clear the focus was. It's so mm -hmm. sharp. Mm -hmm. Those moths. What kind of lenses or equipment do you use? Thank you. I mean, it's it, it's macro photography, so I'm using macro lenses. I have like a 90 millimeter lens that I like to use. Um, I really like Sigma lenses, so I have like a 90 millimeter Sigma lens. Uh, and, you know, um, what you're seeing here on the screen are they're the choice shots because when I'm actually working with the moths constantly they're moving around so I have so much blurry footage that I'm going through because you know when you're shooting at macro at that level you know the the things are going out of focus so quickly just by like a hair a hair amount things will be in focus or out of focus so this definitely represents a, a um, curated selection but yeah when you're working with a narrow focus field on this level, there's there's a lot of precision involved, but there's a lot of patience. Good choice. <laughs> what was your distance between the, the lens and the, the moth? Oh, um, it depends. I mean, usually I'm pretty close. I'd say usually I'm within about four inches, four inches or so, sometimes a little bit further away, but usually about four inches. So if like the moth was the microphone, it'd be like hmm. here. Wow. Yeah. So. In, in, Pretty close. I'm sorry, one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, in, towards the beginning, you were talking so quickly, and you were talking about, I think, kinesthetic? Oh, synesthesia. Uh, say the word? Synes synesthesia. Okay. Yeah. Could you, could you talk a little bit more about that? I worked with, with a person who had kinesthesia, in the, we were talking about music now. Uh-huh. And he said when he heard certain types of music, he reacted and, and he... He had very specific colors yes, that that's came to mind. Exactly. That's part of it, too. So synesthesia is just a term for when the mind cross-associates different senses in a way that may not be um, typical. So color sound is a very common association. Sometimes people have the version of synesthesia where they see an alphabet or numbers, and they prescribe color to it. So it's, it, it's multiple ways of information categorization that the mind is stitching together in uncanny ways. And so for me, it's, um, it's hearing and motion. So whenever I see motion, I, so I, I, I basically, I, I see sounds or I hear images. But there's multiple types. I think there's about seven different types of synesthesia. So... Um, yeah, yeah, so your friend is just an iteration of it, and I'm another side of the data set. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? I know we have to give over the room in a half hour, so yeah. Uh, hi. I, um, I just wanted to say I loved the quote at the very end about um, creating a dream world as an act of hope. Oh, thank you. Uh, and I, I kind of reminded me of a question I like to ask many artists is in your own dream world and a world of no impossibilities, what is a project that you would like to embark on? And that's just 
completely out of the world of <laughs> that we live in. But what would be something that you would do if there were no factors to take and to take into place? Oh my goodness, um, that is a beautiful question. Thank you. So if I had all the resources to do any type of project that I'd want to do. Um, it would probably be a project that related to um, the environment and hard science, but it would probably be something that also had a uh, social engagement with children, because I, I really do like to imagine children as being my uh, ideal audience. I really, I really want to inspire young people to get into experimental film. I really care about this subculture. So I think it would be a project where maybe I would get to work with biologists associated with discovering or researching new butterfly and moth species in the rainforest, because there's tons of moths and butterflies down there in the rainforest that have yet to be categorized, and it's part because entomology just doesn't receive that much funding, much like the arts. There are parts of the sciences that just don't have much funding either. So it would be working with the rainforest, with moth and butterfly species there, and some type of social childhood psychology, maybe, space. And then I'd also f like to find a way of engaging um, the particle physicists that are working at CERN at that big particle accelerator that's in a big circle. I don't know exactly what that project would be, but something about an eye spot on a butterfly wing and a giant particle accelerator, and then just like the awe of engaging, um, like the beauty of, of, of young spirits, that's, that'd be the ideal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the most, exactly, exactly. But that'd be, that'd be amazing to stitch that together. Yeah, thanks for the question. Any other questions? Yeah. You were talking about the, the lighting when you were pouring the honey over that ball. The model How man? did you light that? So the, the lighting is coming entirely from the glowing moon. So it's a 3D printed model of the moon. And the substance that the 3D print is made out of is this um, like PLA products, which looks and acts like plastic, but it's actually like a carbohydrate starch base. Mm. And so it's somewhat translucent. And so um, from the back end of that setup, I actually had a little LED light that was then illuminating the, um, that image. And because I you know, tend to create things in small sets, I actually just had a small set that I had made out of black foam core. So it's like a black foam core box with a hole that was drilled in the side that my hand was through the hole and then the light was coming through kind of the back and projecting out. So, you know, when I'm shooting that shot, like the entire set that I made was really just, you know, a foot, 12 inches by six inches. So it's a very small apparatus. And so when I work really small, I'm able to control the light a lot better. So going tiny is, is really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> for controlling all the different, um, yeah, all the different properties. Yeah, but thank you for that question. Yeah. Virginia, thank you so much. Can so we much. please all give her? Yeah, thank you so much.